morning, church. How are you guys doing today? You know, as, as, as uh, Pastor Dave was uh, speaking, I remember uh, my journey to uh, preaching. And uh, the first time I ever spoke, it was at Bible college, and it was a two-minute sermon on Samuel. And I was shaking so bad, I held on to the pulpit like this, and I was terrified. But I wanted to go scratch my head. And my hand, no lie, was shaking like this. I'm okay. I'm okay. <laughs> and so many times in my life, I remember back to being afraid or scared or called uh, and being called and being afraid to step into those things. But uh, I think of uh, William Wallace and Braveheart. All men die, but only some truly live. And so I, I just want to encourage us all today. If God has called you and you feel a pressing on your heart, um, it's a journey. But don't be afraid to step into that. Um, We are going to be talking about Amos today. He is a minor prophet. We are continuing in our study through the minor prophets. And uh, like we say when we come to the minor prophets, it's uh, men and beards, but there's nothing minor about their message. And that's what we're going to be discussing today. So if you would turn with me to Amos chapter 5, verses 23 and 24. If you have a Bible, if you have a Bible app, uh, please open that up. It's uh, after Ezekiel um, and after Hosea, which we covered two weeks ago. So please turn there. Um, Something I want to encourage us to do this morning as we enter into this message is remember this, that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. This is a very heavy book. God is very upset, but there is still light, and we will see how that plays into the New Testament at the end of this book. Um, I just want to take a moment in our prayer time and uh, pray for the kids' camp that's coming up. I am the preteen director here, and so what I want to do is create a space for all of us to be praying specifically for the kids that will be there. So join with me in prayer for a minute. Dear Heavenly Father, we lift up uh, this today's sermon, but Lord, we go, we go ahead to the week and a half away where kids will be at camp, Lord, having a good time and hearing about your truth and sensing your spirit. Lord, we ask now that you would just move in these kids' lives. You know where they're at. You know what they're struggling through, Lord. You know where their where their families are and what's going on, Lord, and you see them. I pray that as they go to this camp that your spirit would just fall on them and that they would sense your presence and respond to you. I pray that David's would come out of that uh, camp, that Ruth's would come out of that camp, that mighty men and women of God would come from this camp, that you would move through these kids' lives. Be with the workers, Lord. Give them energy. Keep them safe. And uh, give them wisdom. It's in your name I pray this, Jesus. Amen. All right. Amos chapter 5, verses 23 and 24 is where we're going to be hanging out today. We're going to go ahead and read that, and then we're going to work through what the book looks like. We're going to go through nine chapters, but we're just going to highlight some things. Sound good? So if you're ready, can I get a, I am ready. All right, all right. Amos chapter 5, verse 23 and 24. Away with the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the music of your harps, but let justice roll on like a river, righteousness like a never-failing stream. Have you ever, me and a couple friends were talking about this the other day, have you ever rolled up to a stoplight late at night, Nobody's there, and the light's not turning red. And you want to turn left, and you're sitting there for five minutes. It feels like five minutes, more like 30 seconds, but when we're upset and tired, it seems like forever. I remember specifically, I worked at a church down in Southern California as a janitor, and I would have to be the first one there in the morning to unlock the church on a Sunday. It's 6 a.m., I'm tired, and I picked up a student to come roll with me, and I'm getting ready to turn on this street, and the light is just not turning. And I have to be the first one there to unlock, and sometimes the worship team likes to get there early. And no lie, this light would just not turn green at all. And so I said, I looked at the student, I said, don't do this when you grow up. And I just turned <laughs> on the red light. And so many of us, we, here in Ripon, it's like this, the roundabout over on North Ripon Road and uh, River, the stop sign. I don't understand that. I really don't get it. 
And we all have been there where we were like, no one's there. I'm like, forget this. <laughs> Don't look at me and judge me. There's no way I'm the only one, okay? Let's just be real, okay? But oftentimes we're like, uh, nobody's watching. I can get away with this. But think about it. If a cop's there, we're like, what's up, man? One, two, three, oh. I go, right? <laughs> or the stop, stop light and you can be sitting there and the cop's in the parking lot just looking at you like, I'm not turning, man. I'm not doing this. <laughs> I don't want another ticket. The rea- what, what, what the, I build that picture for this idea that what would it be like if we broke the law and a cop was there and he didn't do anything? What would it be like if we broke the law, a cop was there, and he didn't or she didn't do anything? That's where we find ourselves today in the book of Amos. The title of my message is, God Longs for Our Repentance. God Longs for Our Repentance. Repentance. And what we're going to do is we're going to work through the book of Amos uh, very quickly, um, but we're going to slow down in some sections that are very, very important. Uh, Amos is a shepherd in the, from the southern kingdom. He was not a prophet. He didn't go to prophet school. They did have prophet schools, but he didn't go there. So it's funny that Pastor Dave talked about feeling called and God calling people out into ministry who were like, I didn't have that plan. That's how kind of God works sometimes. He, he calls out people. Amos was a shepherd. He was just a normal dude. He did nothing spectacular. He didn't go to school for this. He didn't. But God called Amos and sent him to the northern kingdom. You're like, southern northern kingdom? What are you talking about? Israel, at one point, after Solomon died, broke up into the northern and southern kingdom of Israel. So the northern kingdom was called Israel, the main hub being Bethel, or Bethel, and the southern kingdom was known as Judah. So, Amos is from Judah. God calls him and says, hey, go to the northern kingdom, Israel, and you're going to prophesy to my people there. So, what we find in uh, Amos chapter 1 and 2 is God kind of does this circle. He calls out every nation that is surrounding Israel. He's saying, you have been wicked with this, you have oppressed this person, you have oppressed this person, and he goes to each nation, and then he comes to Israel, and it's like a focal point, and it's like God focuses all his prophetic calling out of their life onto the nation, and he just goes off on how they have been wicked and not following him. And so that brings us to my first point, which is God does not, God does care. Why does God care? Why does God care about how we treat people? Justice and righteousness are extremely important to God. And we're going to see that today, starting in verse two of Amos Verses 6 through 8 says, This is what the Lord says, for, the, for three sins of Israel, even four, I will not relent. They will sell the innocent for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals. They trample on the heads of the poor as the dust of the ground and deny justice to the oppressed. Father and son will use the same girl so, uh, and so profane my holy name. They lie down beside every altar on garments taken in pledge in the house of their God, and they drink wine taken in fines. Without getting too deep into that, because there's a lot of levels we have to hit there, just understand this. God is saying this. You're oppressing people. You are not giving them representation. And you rich, you rich people, the people who are in authority in this kingdom, God takes issue with them because of how they're oppressing the poor. And you're like, well, there's a lot of so, like social injustice and things going on today. But what I want us to focus on is our personal life. Our personal life. Life. So the reality kind of thing that we're looking at here is this. God despises when there's injustice. God hates injustice. And we hear that word today and it's like a trigger word. But let's, let's, let's take it on a personal level. How are we treating people at school, in our jobs, 
in our friendships, in our families. Somebody just going down the street, walking down the street. Somebody that comes from a different social circle than you. or You can see this sometimes in churches where they're not inclusive. It's us and no one else. Like, we're, justice means just us. And that's, that's not how we are supposed to live. We're going to break this down a little bit more. But understand, God takes injustice and non-righteous or unrighteous living very, very serious. He does not mess around with it. And you're like, wait a second, God's going to judge his people for that? And that seems pretty harsh. Why doesn't he do that today? We're going to get to that. Um, But here's the thing. Why is he so upset with Israel? He goes off, he's upset with all the nations around Israel, but why is he getting the most upset with Israel? Because according to Amos 3, verse 2, it says this, You only have I chosen of all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for all your sins. They knew God's truth. They were held accountable because they heard God's word. The reality is this. Everybody in this room today, if you hear the truth, God's going to hold us accountable for that. And that, that seems like a scary thing, but at the same time, it's a good thing. Because what that means is that the church is one of the main ways God has put forth His Spirit on this earth to be distributors of His character, His grace, His mercy, and His justice. And so we are to bear the responsibility of, if you see something wrong, do something about it. And okay, now what we can do here is this. Oh, thank you. That's awesome. I want to go do this. I want to go do that. I want to challenge us today is, are we doing it in our personal life? Let's not create programs. Let's get with God's program and deal with us first. Because this is what we're also going to see, is that the Jewish people were still very, 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 oh yes, praise God, this is awesome. They had worship songs. We'll see that in the beginning part of that main verse. It's like, I don't want to hear your songs anymore, is what God's saying. You're, you're worshiping, you're doing all these cool things, you're doing your offerings to me. He even goes through them, names everything that they've done. He goes, I'm done with it. Because you're not doing righteous things. And you're not being just. So, what we see is this, is that God's being hard on them because they are His people. Think about it, parents. Your friends, your, your friends' kids, you're not as hard as they, you are on your kids. Does that make sense? It's fundamentally that. God is a good parent. He's going to be harder on His children than He is on somebody else's. Does that make sense? So, That is why God is being challenging to His people, saying, I put you on this earth to show who I am, and you have not done that. This is not my character. Now, now I have to judge you because I am a good judge. Why is it so important that we need to be judged, I mean, to be just and righteous? Why, why can't we just live our lives? And like, you're like, hey, Cody, it's like we're not the people of Israel. Why does this even matter? Like, this is not really a big deal to us. Like, this is, it's, I mean, some people are saved, others aren't. Like, why should I be just or why should I be good? My second point is this. Something about this image Something about this image. And it brings us to the main verse in chapter 5, verse 23 and 24. Again, we'll read it. It says, Away with the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the music of your harps. But let justice roll on like a river, and righteousness like a never-failing stream. What Something about this image, or... The idea here is this, is in a theological term, there's this term that comes from Genesis. It's called the Imago Dei. That's I-M-A-G-O, Imago. It's Greek, it means image. And then Dei is D-E-I, it means 
God. Image of God. What does that mean? It means we as human beings are fundamentally, that means in our very base nature, what we were created from is God. We are created in His image. What does that mean? We have dignity as human beings. We have rights. You know, the founding father said, we, 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 uh, oh man, I forgot it in this moment. But you know what I'm saying. So the reality here is this, is that we were all endowed with certain inalienable rights. There we go. I got it. Sweet. Okay, so we all have dignity. What does that mean? Every human being on this planet should be treated ju- justly. Now, here's the thing. When God's just, what does He do with those who are doing wrong? He deals with them, right? He judges them. But here's the thing. You'll see this in chapter 6 more and more. um, Is that God says, seek me. I want you to repent. Otherwise, I have to judge you. Seek me. Seek good and live. He constantly says this throughout the book of Amos. He's like, I don't want to pour out my wrath on you, but you are living in a way that I'm going to have to. And ultimately, the northern kingdom falls to Assyria where they get so utterly destroyed. Even Amos prophesies about this. They get led away by uh, hooks in their jaw and taken back to Assyria as captives. Like, The Syrians were no joke, and God even prophesied and said, yes, if you continue on your path, you're going to be led away by hooks, even fish hooks. So God ends up judging this nation because they will not repent, and they won't hear what God says. And so much so that Amos in chapter 7 essentially is called out by the king Jeroboam. The funny thing about this time of the nation of Israel is this, is they are... They have King Jeroboam the second, and he just he's like a military fiend and like really good with money and tactics. And so they are at a time of high prosperity. And here comes this this shepherd from the southern kingdom that they don't like, that they've gone to war with a couple times. And he's like, "Hey, repent, tear down your idols, and turn to the Lord." And so the king looks at him like, "You're crazy, man. Uh, get out of my country." They have no desire to hear what God says. But let's focus on this. We're going to bring it back to us. It says, but let justice roll on like a river and righteousness like a never failing stream. Let's talk about righteousness first. What does that mean? It's a Hebrew Hebrew word, zedekah. It means right relationship. Right, Right relationships Equity despite social differences. It means handling things well. It's how you live towards others. Making sure that you are treating others with respect, honesty, and thinking of others. The next word is justice. Hebrew word, mishpat. Actions taken to correct injustice specifically. That is a hard, hard word to hear because so many times we don't notice. Isn't that the hard part? It's like, I don't know what justice is and what injustice is. I'm just living my life, especially if you're having like a good time with your friends. And you're like laughing. <laughs> and then all of a sudden you forget that there's somebody over there that the joke was about or something and they're, not, they're new to the group. I'm like, oh no, and things get happen. Or you're at school and you totally start making fun of someone else. Or you're at work and you take advantage of a new worker. Or you're the new employee and you start taking advantage of your boss. There's so many layers and levels that this gets taken down. And even in the workplace, it's kind of like, or even in school, workplace, whatever, wherever you might be, it's the, if you see the injustice, especially with the authorities above you, you're like, I don't want to approach this. What's going to happen to me? I just want to live in my bubble. I want to be okay. This is going to cause an inconvenience for my life, make my life harder. What am I going to do? Jesus talks about this. It's called the story of the Good Samaritan. It says this man went down, to, went down from Jerusalem. Now remember who he's talking to. He's talking to the people of Israel who were very, very much anti-Rome, anti-anybody that's Jewish. We, God's chosen people. We are God's chosen people. So he tells this story. He goes, this man came down from Jerusalem. He gets jumped and beat up. 
to almost death. And there's three people that pass by him. One is a priest. Does nothing. He's like, I've got to get somewhere. I've got to take care of my priestly duties. Two, a Levite. And a Levite is essentially part of the priesthood, the family. He looks at him and says, I don't, I don't have time. I've got to go take care of my responsibilities as a priest. Then this dude comes along. He's a Samaritan. Why does that matter? Because the Jewish people saw the Samaritans as less human than them. They're not God's chosen people. I don't care. What God is calling us to do. He says, that Samaritan, he takes care of him. He takes him, he takes this beat up guy from Jeru- on, from, who left Jerusalem, got beat up. He takes him, takes him to an inn, drops him off, talks to the innkeeper and says, here's two mites, take care of him, and I will come back to you in a couple days, and whatever else he needs, I will pay for. God cares about how we treat people. The hard part for us is not, oftentimes not wanting to do something. It's slowing down enough to do something about it. Righteousness and justice require us to not be, one word, lazy. That is the hardest part. We've all been there, and I'm not, I'm not up here saying I'm any better. Than, believe me. I'm reading this text this week, and I'm like, Lord, this is going to hurt. I do not enjoy this. This is challenging. Lord, you are dealing with some things in my heart because I've got 3,000 things to do. None of them include slowing down for someone who needs something. Because isn't that usually how injustice happens or someone in need comes along? We didn't plan for that. We never do. Like, that's life. (laughs) It always happens when we're least expecting it. And so, we must understand as God's people, we have a responsibility to handle these things well. You know... James says this in James 4.17. It says, If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and does not do it, it is sin for them. Oftentimes we think that we are good just by being Christians. But God wants right action. He wants In fact, he expects it because we're his kids. But here's the thing. He's talking to Israel. Why does that matter to us? God is consistently getting on his people Israel. You have done this. You have done this. You keep sinning. I'm calling you out, but return to me. Come to me. I want to have a relationship with you. I don't want to judge you. The Bible says that God is slow to wrath. He does not want to pour out the wrath on His people. He doesn't want to. We have to see this because we can come to the Old Testament and be like, and you've heard this if you've had any conversation with anybody that's not saved, or maybe you or this person is, well, God of the Old Testament and God of the New Testament, two different gods. God's very harsh and very, very, very harsh with those in the Old Testament and those who aren't His people. And the God of the New Testament are like, I don't see that today. How's that? Like, there's a break there. I don't understand that. We'll get to that, why that happens. But understand this, that God is still the same today, yesterday, today, oh, yesterday, today, and forever. Amos chapter 9 says this, verses 11 and 14. God, at this point, God has said, I'm going to judge Israel. You have not turned. You have not repented. There's no, you, you want nothing to do with me. He even prophesied to one point, I'm going to send a famine. And it has nothing to do with your, your uh, irrigation or agriculture. It has everything to do with your spiritual life. You're not going to hear God talk to you. That's a scary place to be when God's like, I'm done. You're not going to hear me at all. Verse 11 of chapter 9, and then we'll go to verse 14 and 15. It says, In that day, I will restore David's fallen shelter. This is God saying, Hey, I know I'm going to destroy these people, but 
I, I want redemption so bad, I'm going to bring them back. I will restore David's fallen shelter. I will repair its broken walls and restore its ruins and will rebuild it as it used to be. Verse 14. And I will bring my people Israel back from exile. They will, be, they will rebuild the ruined cities and live in them. They will plant vineyards and drink their wine. They will make gardens and eat their fruit. I will plant Israel in their own land, never again to be uprooted from the land I have given them, says the Lord. As you can see, God still promises to bring them back. God does deal with them. And in A.D. or uh, B.C. 7, uh, 722, they fell to the Assyrian Empire. How did they fall? They were, again, they were doing the religious things. They were having their offerings, giving their offerings to the Lord and all, all of that. But they would not live according to what God's truth said. God cares about how we live. He watches all of it. And what we learn in the story of the Good Samaritan is this. The lack of noticing things God even holds us responsible for. So the challenge for us is this, is to, God, give us your eyes to see the things around us. God, teach me to be able to be inconvenienced by those around me so I can be there for them. Verse, uh, point number three, and we're closing out with this. Who are we? This makes sense, like, to us. We're reading this as God's talking about Israel. But what does this have to do with us? Why does this matter? We hear about the Good Samaritan, yes, but what does that have to do with with us. Everything. If you turn to the book of Acts, you don't have to turn right now, but if you have time, if you go to Acts 15, the gospel is spreading. Barnabas and Saul, or Paul later on, are on a missions trip. They encounter a bunch of Gentiles. They're dealing and helping Gentiles get saved and all of that. And then there was rumors that Jews were telling Gentiles, hey, Gentiles have to get circumcised in order to be saved. And they're like, hold up, let's, let's go talk about this. So they all come to Jerusalem, and they convene and have this, this pastors get together sometimes and talk about, okay, what is it we believe? It's a theological conversation. Does a Gentile need to go through this process to be saved or not? Let's, let's talk about it. Is this important or not? And that's essentially what's happening here in Acts chapter 15. And you guys know the book of James. It's Pastor Dave's favorite book. You guys following along with me? That is Jesus' brother. He is also the pastor or the leader of the church of Jerusalem. And, and he speaks up and references these verses in Amos. And that is in Acts chapter 15, verses 16 through 19. It says, he quotes Amos and says, After this I will return and rebuild David's fallen tent. It, it, its ruins I will rebuild and I will restore it, that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who bear my name, says the Lord, who does, not, who does these things. These uh, things known from, a long, from long ago, it is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. What does all that mean? You're like, that was a lot of verses, I don't know what's going on. This is what it means, that when, when Amos prophesied that God was going to bring his people back and rebuild, it was going to include us who are Gentiles that are not part of the Jewish family, and we will be grafted in, as the Bible says, to be part of God's family. So what we look at when we look at this book, Amos, we realize something very important if we are Christians, that we believe in the work of the cross, that we have given our lives to Jesus, that we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that Jesus Christ is his Lord, we are responsible to do just and righteousness. But there's still a problem. Why is it different from the God of the Old Testament and the New Testament? It's a good question. 
It's a hard question, isn't it? We oftentimes we're like, this doesn't make sense. It's, a, it's an answer that we, we know, but we don't know that we know it. If I could have the ministry teams come to the stage. Righteousness and justice is something that's very hard for us to distribute, to pay attention to. And even when we're fallen and we can't focus and we can't remember, it's hard for us to muster it up. So I build this picture to say this. God didn't leave it up to us anymore. God did pour out all of his wrath, but he poured it out on a person. You want to know why the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament seem different? But I promise you he's the same. Because all that wrath, all that judgment for sin was poured out on one person and his name is Jesus. All of it. Every ounce. Scripture says that God poured out His wrath on Jesus. So that judgment for sin only happens in two places. In hell for all eternity or at the cross of Jesus Christ. He is the same God yesterday, today, and forever. God loves us so much. He wants us to come to Him so bad that He cut Himself in half for us. That's why Jesus died. Because if it was left up to us, He would be utterly destroyed. You want to know how God sees our sin and injustice and like unrighteousness? Look no further than the God man who hung on the cross for our sins. That's how serious he takes this. God has not stopped judging, he just poured it out on himself. You know, the Bible says that every, one day every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. For those who love Jesus and have given our life to Him, that is an awesome moment. But God's coming again. We're living in the time of the Gentiles, is what Scripture says. Now is the time of salvation. What does that mean for us if we are believers in Christ? To lift our heads up and look at the world around us. Starts with our hearts. God changes me. Help me to be more aware. Help me to reach out to that family member. Help me to reach out to those people. And I know there's family dynamics and things that are, Cody, you don't understand. I get that. I get that. I'm not talking about that stuff. I'm talking about allowing God to speak to your heart. Ask Him, Lord, what are you asking me to do? Because you have God's Spirit. Because you believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins. If we could bow our heads and close our eyes in this last moment, I want to give an opportunity for those who may not know the Lord or given their life over to Him. The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, you will be saved. Why do we need to be saved? Because we have sinned against God and to God take sin so seriously that He crucified His Son so that we may have a relationship with Him. You know, we talked about uh, at the end of worship that the veil was torn. We can enter into His presence. And maybe you're here today and you don't feel His presence and you feel alone and lost. It's because you have not accepted Jesus into your heart. And I just want to present that opportunity to you today. If you would like to receive Jesus as Lord and Savior of your life, because he's no longer dead, he's alive. Just lift your hand up in this moment. If you would like to rededicate 
and say, Lord, I have not lived in a, in a way in life that is good, that is holy, that is just and righteous. And you want to recommit to allow the Lord to move through your life. Just lift your hand in this moment. Lord, we come to you now. We thank you so much for today. We ask that in this time of worship as we come to the altar, Lord, that we would we would allow you to speak to us, Lord, that we would, Lord, we need you. You're so good that you sent your son to die for us. Lord, thank you for your goodness and your blessing. But, Lord, I pray that you would just help us lift our eyes, Lord. You're such a good father. You love us so much that you sent your son to die for us so that we may have relationship with you. Thank you, Lord. It's in your name I pray this, Jesus. Amen. We're going to continue in time of worship if you'll stand with us. Let's just take this next, these next two songs at the time to remember and to say thank you for all the Lord has done.